Module 2 is the female reproductive system, both the anatomy and the physiology. The objectives of this module are to identify the female reproductive structures and describe the function of each, describe the role of hormones in the menstrual and ovarian cycles, describe menopause, mammary development, milk production, etc., and identify the major female reproductive disorders. The ovary is the primary sex organ in the female. Like the testes in the male, there are two, and their job is to produce gametes, eggs in this case. The remaining organs exist to facilitate egg development or movement or maintain a pregnancy. The secondary sex organs include the uterus, fallopian tubes, breasts, cervix, vagina, labia, etc. The ovaries are very small, only about a half inch by 1.8 by 2.8 inches in size, and are held by ligaments attached to the back of the pelvic cavity. They develop before birth and descend to the correct location just like testes do. The inner region of the ovaries is referred to as the medulla and the outer region the cortex. The cortex is where the follicles mature and release the secondary oocyte. The process of making eggs is called oogenesis and is quite similar to spermatogenesis, but from each primary oocyte you only get one egg produced. Remember, in males, from each primary spermatocyte, you get four sperm. During meiosis in females, when the cells divide, only one viable cell remains, and the other, a polar body, is too small to survive and is reabsorbed. You'll see this in the next picture. Oogonia develop to primary oocytes before birth of the female. At puberty, some of the primary oocytes are stimulated to continue meiosis when FSH is released. The first split result in one secondary oocyte and a polar body. The second half of meiosis does not complete until sperm arrives, so essentially if there's no sperm, meiosis doesn't get ever get done in the female. Sperm initiate the second split and you get one egg, which is immediately fertilized by the sperm and called a zygote, and a second polar body. Polar bodies degenerate, resulting in the egg having all the cytoplasm, which it needs to nourish the zygote for the first week or so during cell division. This is diagrammed in the next slide so you can see it here. Again, the primary oocytes are triggered to start meiosis at puberty. The first division generates a secondary oocyte, which gets all the cytoplasm in the split. So the other half, this polar body, just the nucleus, degenerates. It can't survive. The second step of meiosis, okay, secondary meiosis too, does not occur unless there's a sperm around and it only has about 24 hours to survive before, if no sperm, it's going to die. If a sperm penetrates the secondary oocyte, meiosis completes and now there's an egg or an ovum, but that is momentary because the DNA from the sperm will fuse with the DNA of the egg and fertilization occurs and the fertilized egg is then called a zygote. This slide compares both spermatogenesis and oogenesis. In spermatogenesis, it takes place in the testes and they receive equal genetic material and equal cytoplasm, and the cycle is continuous from puberty as long as the man produces FSH and testosterone until he dies, while oogenesis occurs at puberty and only goes until about menopause. The result is of spermatogenesis is four sperm, but in oogenesis, you only get one egg, and that only if there's a sperm around. The polar bodies degenerate. If the egg and sperm both have half the DNA, sorry, the egg and sperm have both have half the DNA of the primary cells, and they fuse to form a zygote. If you can't answer these questions, how is oogenesis different from spermatogenesis, and what is the end result of both, you need to go back and listen to the last few slides again. The ovaries and the female reproductive tract are in close proximity but are not directly connected. The uterine tube at the end is called the infundibulum, and you can see that in this diagram, okay, right here. And it is not directly touching the ovary, although it looks like this in the plastic models and in this diagram. It's actually kind of hovering over the ovary, and as the secondary oocyte is released, the follicles rupture, that infundibulum catches it and it pulls it down the uterine tube. The fallopian tubes, or called the uterine tubes more recently, lead to the uterus from each ovary. 
They are about 4 inches in length and that's where fertilization takes place. The flared end, the infundibulum, which is kind of a funnel shape, has fimbrae used to capture the secondary oocyte upon ovulation. The uterus is about the size and shape of a pear. It receives the fertilized egg, then called a blastocyst at this point, and we'll go into the development in the next module, and it implants into the inner lining of the uterus, which is called the endometrium. The very muscular wall is the myometrium. You should recall that this is smooth muscle, as it is not under voluntary control. The outer lining of the uterus is sometimes referred to as the perimetrium. The uterus extends to the cervix, the lower end of the uterus, which then leads to the vagina. The vagina is an elastic muscular tube connecting the cervix of the uterus to the vulva and the exterior of the body. It is located in the pelvic body cavity posterior to the urinary bladder and anterior to the rectum. Measuring about 3 inches in length and less than an inch in diameter, it stretches to become several inches longer and many inches wider, either during sexual intercourse or childbirth. The inner surface of the vagina is folded to provide greater elasticity and to increase fr friction during sexual intercourse. Watery secretions produced by the vaginal epithelium lubricate the vagina and have an, uh, an acidic pH to prevent the growth of bacteria and yeast. The acidic pH also makes the vagina an inhospitable environment for sperm, which has resulted in males producing alkaline seminal fluid to neutralize the acid and improve the likelihood of survival of the sperm. The cervix is the base of the uterus. The fornix is the region uh, recessed on either side. You can see on either side. The cervix of the uterus acts as a gatekeeper of the uterus by controlling when substances can pass in and out. This helps prevent infection. To assist this role, the epithelial lining of the cervix produces a thick cervical mucus that fills the cervical canal and forms a mucus plug blocking the flow of material between the uterus and the vagina. Around the time of ovulation, the consistency of this mucus becomes much thinner, allowing the passage of sperm into the uterus for fertilization. During pregnancy, the cervix and its mucus plug protect the developing fetus by sealing the uterus from possible contamination by external pathogens. Again, the vagina is about 3 inches in length and the width is variable as it is very distendable. It has rugae, or little folds, and you can kind of see them in this diagram, to allow for stretching. The vagina will dilate, just like the penis, during arousal. The vulva, or the labia, is the external genitalia. The next slide shows this a little bit better. The outer folds of skin are filled with fat and are protective. This is the vulva or the labia. The clitoris, analogous to the glans penis, is the most anterior portion of the vulva. The space between the labia is the vestibule and glands there secrete a lubricating fluid that nearly mimics the consistency of the bulbourethral gland. The labia can be used to create a scrotum in transgender operations. Just like in the male, the parasympathetic nervous system causes vasodilation, here in the vagina instead of the penis, which expands and elongates to accommodate the penis. Vestibular glands in the labia secrete a lubricating fluid similar to what the male releases from the bulbourethral gland. Although orgasm, orgasm is not required for sex or pregnancy, it does seem to increase the rate of fertility in women because it causes the cervix to pull up the sperm into the uterus, which peristalsis is moving down, so sperm have to swim up against the current, and the cervix pulling uh, reverses that and helps increase the odds that the sperm reach the egg. Before birth, the follicles will begin to mature. Of the several million there, only about one to two million will still be left by the time the little girl is born, and even more is lost by the time the girl gets to puberty. About 400,000 remain viable, and at each cycle, many will start to mature under the influence of follicle-stimulating hormone. However, only the dominant follicle, which is usually the largest one, will rupture and release a secondary oocyte at ovulation. In her lifetime, only about four to 500 uh, secondary oocytes will be released. Fewer if she has more children, because rarely do women ovulate or produce eggs during pregnancy, and many won't do that during nursing either. Follicle-stimulating hormone stimulates the primary, or 
to the secondary oocyte maturation process. The oocytes inside the follicle are inside the follicles, which as they mature, get larger. The largest or most mature follicle will rupture and release the secondary oocyte. The other ones will degenerate. This takes about 10 to 14 days. The rupture and release is referred to as ovulation. After the secondary oocyte is released, the follicle, what's left over, remains and it becomes the corpus luteum. The follicle has two layers of epithelial uh, cells which are called the granulosal cells and the thecal cells. These cells are what are going to produce estrogen and progesterone. You can see this in the animation if you'd like to click that link. Here you can see how the follicles start to mature. The first 14 days, and the days are around the outside of this circle, more than one will start to mature. At day 14, the largest or the most dominant follicle ruptures and releases the secondary oocyte. What's left over, this little blue thing here, becomes the corpus luteum, which looks yellow, hence the word lutea, which means yellow in Latin. Here's a great picture of ovulation. You can see the oocyte being released from the follicle as it ruptures and being caught by the fimbrae of the uterine tube. Some women say they can feel this. An ultrasound of an ovary can detect scars where the ovary has healed after each ovulation. These two cycles will be discussed at length uh, using the diagram on the next slide. Make sure you understand the difference between the mental cycle and the ovarian cycle. First look at the bottom frame. This is showing the thickness of the endometrium, the lining of the uterus, over a 28 day period. The menstrual cycle is about 28 days in length on average. The first days is when the lining is being lost. Menstruation is occurring. After about three to five days, the lining starts to build up again, preparing for ovulation and a possible conception. Notice in the second frame up, the green line is the level of progesterone. And this hormone causes the lining to thicken, so it kind of mimics the same uh, path as the thickness of the lining. When progesterone gets high, the lining gets thicker. This hormone uh, thickens the lining so it is at the most ready if implantation were need, needed to occur. If there is no implantation, progesterone levels drop and the lining is then lost. This happens about every 28 days. Now look up at the third frame from the bottom. This is the ovarian cycle. The events have to do with the ovary, not the uterus. Follicle stimulating hormone stimulates follicular growth on day one of menstruation. And during the next 14 days, the follicles will mature. Hey, no. So this is referred to as the follicular phase. Estrogen is produced as the follicle grows. Estrogen is at the highest right before ovulation, and estrogen is the pink line here, because it functions to block the release of LH. On day 13, estrogen levels drop, LH peaks, and ovulation occurs. You can see the follicle is ruptured, and the secondary oocyte is released. So, the first 14 days of the follicular phase, at day 14 is ovulation. At this point, what's left over of the follicle becomes this corpus luteum. The corpus luteum really likes to produce progesterone in particular, but it also produces estrogen, and both of those hormones, the pink and the green line here, go up. Okay, so as the corpus luteum develops, it produces more and more progesterone as well as some estrogen. The second 14 days, because what's being really active here is the corpus luteum, is referred to as the luteal phase. And unless a signal from the uterus comes along and says implantation has occurred, uh, the luteal phase will only last about 14 days. It, the corpus luteum will regress because it didn't get that signal. Estrogen progesterone won't be made, so they both drop. And as they both drop, the lining of the uterus is lost, and the cycle starts all over again.
This slide summarizes the actions of estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen is released from both the follicle and the corpus luteum. It helps thicken the lining before ovulation and prevent LH release until day 13. Progesterone maintains the lining. It also maintains a pregnancy. So think of progesterone as maintaining the lining um, or maintaining a pregnancy. To review what was discussed back in the endocrine chapter, recall that the hormones are the same until the reproductive gland itself, uh, which we didn't discuss back in the endocrine chapter. We talked about GnRH, FSH, and LH, but not as much about testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. This is why estrogen and progesterone are used as birth control because they can both feed back and negatively turn off GnRH, FSH, and LH. Another hormone produced by both sexes is inhibited. This too can block FSH. The ovaries and testes start out as the very same thing during development. If there's an X and Y chromosome, so the kid's going to be a boy, there's a small amount of testosterone produced during <coughs> development and testes are made. If there is no burst of testosterone, ovaries develop instead. Ladies, you are female by default. Just like at puberty, testosterone has lots of effect on boys, estrogen has several effects on women. Both bone and muscle growth uh, occur, but not quite as much. Estrogen protects against cholesterol and plaques, which is good. It lowers heart rate or heart diseases until menopause. There's not any effect on the cartilage around the larynx, so we don't get deepening of the voice. And fat deposition changes. We tend to get more fat put on our hips and our breasts versus before puberty or men. Breast development begins at puberty, but at that time is mostly just fat until a female is pregnant. At this time, progesterone spurs the development of the glands and in preparation for milk production. So you get ducts and mammary glands instead of just fat. Progesterone also suppresses the prolactin receptor from being ma made. So even though prolactin starts to go up, it can't induce milk production until progesterone levels drop, which happens when a woman gives birth. Prolactin induces milk synthesis, but again, initially it doesn't work because there's no receptor. You won't actually produce actual milk until after you give birth. The initial secretion is called colostrum and is not really milk because it doesn't have milk protein in it. So many women are encouraged to nurse this first time because colostrum contains many antibodies from mom which will help the baby's immune system even though it does not yet have milk protein. The release of milk is caused by the hormone oxytocin. The nervous system stimulates this upon uh, physical stimulation of the breast or even a baby crying. Once the ovaries stop producing estrogen, the menstrual and ovarian cycles slowly come to a stop. Menstruation may become irregular before stopping entirely, and this could take months to years. This is referred to as menopause. It happens at around the age 50 can vary quite a bit. It's quite hereditary, so ask your mom, ladies. A woman is considered in menopause after menstruation has not occurred for at least one year. The loss of estrogen causes a variety of side effects uh, in the female, including shrinking of the accessory organs, increased bone loss, leading to an increased risk of osteoporosis, less protection of the heart, leading to increased risk of heart disease, thinner skin, hotter flash, hot flashes, fatigue, and headaches. The vestibular glands in the vagina do not produce fluid, making sex more painful. Hormone replacement therapy was used for years to lessen these side effects, but now it's not used quite as much anymore because of the increased risk of breast cancer and other female cancers associated with hormone replacement therapy. Endometriosis is often a painful disorder in which the tissue that normally lines the inside of your uterus, the endometrium, grows outside your uterus. Endometriosis is most, most commonly involves your ovaries, bowel, or even the tissues lining your pelvis. It can be quite painful. A vaginal yeast infection is a fungal infection that causes irritation, discharge, and intense itchiness of the vagina and vulva. Tissues at the vag vaginal opening can be affected by the yeast. It's a type of vaginitis or inflammation. 
It can also affect, it usually affects three out of four women at some point in their lifetimes. Many women experience at least two episodes, and it can be spread through genital, mouth to genital contact or from uh, a partner. Common STDs or STIs include chlamydia, gonorrhea, trichomoniasis, and sometimes HIV, syphilis, herpes, HPV, and hepatitis. Most STIs have no initial symptoms but can be easily spread. The most common cancers of the reproductive organs are uterine, cervical, and ovarian, but breast cancer is the most common kind of cancer in women. If you need some more information, your online text and lesson can help. Websites, but be careful what you Google when you look for reproductive information, and the lab manual has a master list. Sorry about the sirens, apparently we're having a storm.